Acts uh, 11 and 12. These are the final chapters of this particular unit and are focusing on, on uh, Peter. Unit 1 of our division of the book of Acts, the first 12 chapters, focus on two apostles, uh, uh, Peter and, and also the deacon, uh, Philip. But uh, the second part will be, of course, Paul. But this is the wrap-up of Unit 1, and our focus will, of course, be on Peter. And so last time we were dealing with the Cornelius vision where God uses chapter 9, in effect, to um, uh, get Paul converted, and then chapter 10 to open the door to the Gentiles. It's very interesting that God opens the door by Peter, but then gives the burden of that ministry primarily to Paul. Peter and Paul both agree with each other, much to, Paul, much to Paul's regret, because he had his heart for the Jews. That's where he came from. But he re reluctantly acknowledges that his mission is a calling to the Gentiles. And Peter, even though he opened the door to the Gentiles, his real focus will, in the future, be primarily to Israel. So we'll notice that. So we're going to be in opening up in chapter 11, and we'll finish 12 to finish this unit for ourselves. Antioch, in the meantime, rises to prominence. And it's the, the real ministry to the Gentiles emerges out of Antioch. J Jerusalem is going to fade into the background now. And uh, the, it, I might add that the first 18 verses of chapter 10 are basically a recap of what we had uh, uh, in chapter 10. The first 18 verses um, are the recap. So chapter 11 for the first 18 verses will just be an echo of what you had last time. So just bear with me as we go through. And... Uh, Use that as our warm-up here. And the apostles and the brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, that they were of the circumcision, they that they were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and did eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying, and here's where he repeats pretty much what we talked about last time. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in the trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend as it had been, a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon which I then fastened mine eyes, and I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And you can infer from all of that they were not kosher, okay? And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. And I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou uncommon. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there was three men already come into the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me to go with them, doubting nothing, Moreover, these six brethren, this is where we pick up the number here, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And this is, as I say, this is how we, get, this is how we got ten people uh, at Joppa. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, and stood by and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell the uh, words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell upon them as on us at the beginning. Then, I, then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace, and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So they understand. Praise God. What's implied in chapter 10 is expressly stated here. So there's no room for misunderstanding here. And so, okay. Now, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose from, Stephen's, from Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice, and Cyprus and Antioch preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. Now, Phoenicia is a strip of the Mediterranean coast between Caesarea, northward, about 100 miles. It's about halfway to Antioch. And uh, Cyprus is a rich and productive island southwest of Seleucia. 
So this is the, obviously the Far Eastern Mediterranean area that we're dealing with. Now, Antioch is the third largest city after Roman Alexandria. So this is, this is a key uh, uh, cent uh, center of influence. It's north of Damascus from the mountain range of Antilabanus, which flows the ancient river Orontes, flowing north 200 miles and then bends westward by the mountain chain. But Amanus, about after southwest, less than 20 miles, it empties into the Mediterranean. And at the bend of this river, on its left bank, Seleucus Nicator, one of Alexander's greatest generals and successors, and the founder of the Seleucid dynasty of the, of the Greek kings of Syria, built the city of Antioch in 300 BC as the capital of the Syrian Empire. So that's the real uh, leverage here. It is the capital of the then Syrian Empire. And uh, it, uh, Antioch enjoyed unequal privileges, natural and geographical. It rose to be known as the Queen of the East. So this is a big deal. The harbor at Seleucia on the Mediterranean, open country lying to the east of the Lebanon Range. The Grove of Daphne, the main street, was four miles long. That was a big deal. Uh, work in Antioch commenced without Jerusalem but for the church here. So they, they are on their own, really, from a growth point of view. Some of them were men of uh, Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, Cyrene lay on the north shore of the Mediterranean between Carthage and Egypt. And uh, you remember Simon of Cyrene was the one who carried Jesus' cross, was from that area. And uh, they often speak of the Mediterranean as a Roman lake, really. So you need to understand that the northern, shore, north, northern coast of Africa was very much part of the Roman Empire. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. And the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. Okay. See, the center of influence begins to shift from Jerusalem to Antioch which then becomes the primary base for the churches, especially the Gentile churches. Who, when he came, he had seen the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all that with the purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. So he exhorted them. Barnabas is the son, is the son of comfort, the son of exhortation. So that's, he, he's got a good record here. He becomes the pastor here. And he needs an assistant. And guess what? He knows a good one. He's got an old friend from his days in Tarsus. So then departed Barnabas to Tarsus to seek Paul. Excuse me, Saul. He'll be called Paul later. Um, he's sort of uh, Antioch's executive recruiter. So he's out to get himself a strong partner here. So he's the first to recognize the genuineness of uh, uh, Saul's conversion. And uh, it's interesting that when he goes to Antioch and sees the action, he does not return to Jerusalem. Instead, he tracks down Saul in, Tart uh, in, in the Tarsus. And when he had found him, he brought him into unto, uh, Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year, for a whole year, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So that's where that term is first used. And uh, probably on an evang evangelistic tour. And uh, the first use might have been actually a, uh, it's, it's a word, it's a Greek word with a Latin termination. It's no longer a, considered a sect of Hebraism, if you will. In fact, the very term might have started in a derogatory way. Just like the British you know, used, to speak, used to speak of Yankee Doodle Dandy and so forth. It was originally a pejorative phrase, but it was picked up by them as a, as a compliment. So it may be a similar pattern here. That's speculation. Well, on Paul's previous return from Caesarea to Tarsus, he appears to have taken the land route through Syria and Cilicia. And afterwards, with Judas, Silas, Barnabas, uh, with a letter from the Council of Jerusalem, quote, unto the brethren of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. A dearth or a famine. Uh, uh, you know, a, yes, exactly. So um, there were, at least that we know, four specific local uh, 
famines under Claudius. The first and second years it was in Rome, the fourth year it was in Judea, and the ninth year it was in Greece, and the eleventh year in Rome. So there was dark times in terms of just providing food for the empire. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Here again we always notice that of these churches, the ones that seem to be the mo under the most judgment and, and having the toughest time are those that are in Judea and in specifically in Jerusalem. So there was a general famine, but the effect was especially felt in Jerusalem, where the church had been persecuted, decimated, and hurt. They were in dire need during this time. And the, uh, the first spontaneous gatherings of voluntary relief for their brethren in Judea is showing up here which also they did and sent it by the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. A bit of irony here because the hands that previously had attacked them are now bringing the relief. So don't miss the ir irony here. Saul assists Barnabas for at least one year. And there's some summary comments I want to put in here. One of continuity. Stephen's martyrdom spreads the effort. Because of his martyrdom, the efforts were spread. And then Peter's vision, we have in a sense, the church's eyesight is broadened to see the Gentiles. And Saul's apprehension turns out to be Antioch's supply, interestingly enough. And there's absolute freedom, independent actions going on here. The men of Cyprus, Cyrene, preach to the Greeks and sending a Barnabas by the apostles and the finding of Saul by Barnabas. So there's real independent actions here. That's all healthy. It's very healthy. And the collection for Judea, of course, was spontaneous. They just did it because they sensed the need and they responded to that. So praise God for that. There's unity here. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is in all and through all. That's Paul's plea in Ephesians chapter 4. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all, who is in all and through all. There's a sign hanging in our ministry. Uh, attributed to Augustine. In essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, agape. Oh, if we would just adopt that style. How painful it must be to our Lord that we find the littlest things to divide over, to terminate fellowship over. We need to be diligent to sound doctrine. We need to be unified in the essentials. But we need to determine some things as non-essentials. Walter Martin was so good at that. He really recognized there were theological things that are not central. Let that, let that not divide us. Perpetual variety here. Apostolic gift, evangelistic gifts, prophetic gifts, and the pastoral gifts. Again, Ephesians 4. Celebrate these. And no one man can win a soul. The Holy Spirit uses some to plant the seeds, some to water, and some to harvest. And we need to realize that God is the one doing the work. And so that sets us up for the final chapter of this excursion that we call Unit 1 of the Book of Acts. And we're going to find Peter arrested and we have Herod suffer his untimely death here. So, so here we are. I'll give you a quick perspective of the Book of Acts. We have the Ascension in Chapter 1. We have Pentecost, the birth of the church, Chapter 2. The Outraging of Stephen, Chapter 7. These are the highlights we've looked at. Philip and Ethiopian treasure in chapter 8. I think that's special. The call of Paul, of course, in chapter 9. And uh, now Peter's then we saw Peter's vision of Cornelius opening the doors to the Gentiles in chapter 10. And uh, then the mission of the Gentiles will occur both here and the beginning, especially in the second unit, if you will. And so Antioch will now be the center, not Jerusalem from now on. Jerusalem, the center of the church's operations, passes out of sight. It appears only two more times in the council regarding Gentile obligations in chapter 15, and that's a big one for a lot of reasons, and Paul's visit compelled to seek Roman protection for his life. He, from his heart, wanted to deal with the Jews, and the Romans had to arrest him to save his life. He's slowly getting the message that his calling is in a different direction. And uh, so we're now in chapter 12, verse 1. Now about the time, about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. So Herod is going to start picking on Herod Agrippa I. He's the nephew of Herod Antipas, who was the Antipas. Herod Agrippa I is the nephew of Herod Antipas, who murdered John the Baptist. Okay. The Herods were Edomites, Idumean. And uh, 
This leads, if I may again, because I know this is, this is a, a short chapter, so I'm going to take the occasion here to highlight something that we, I'm going to encourage you to do your own study on and find out what is an Edomite. That turns out not to be a peripheral issue, and many of us are the victims of our little maps in the back of the Bible that are, are misleading in a sense. Who is an Edomite today? And the answer may surprise you. I want to talk about the Olam Iba, the everlasting hatred that started in the womb between Esau and Jacob. In, when Esau and Jacob were in the womb, they were already fighting, and that fighting endures to this day. The Herods of the New Testament were Edomites. What does that really mean? And uh, one of them killed the Jewish babies in his attempt to destroy Christ in Matthew 2. Another Herod murdered John the Baptist. And another Herod killed James, the brother of John. So these guys have quite a batting history here. The struggle between the Israelis and the so-called Arabs today is a continuation of this battle that started in Genesis 25. And what the press calls, uh, press has no grasp what an Arab is. The term they use really should point to Muslims, but let's not get into that here. Now, we have these little uh, maps in our Bible, and over on the east of the Jordan, we up north we have the Bashan, then we have the Amorites, and then we have Moab, and then we have down here southeast of the, the, uh, the uh, Dead Sea, we have Edom. And from that, we think of Edom. Well, that's those guys down there because we haven't done our homework. You see, east of them were the Nabataeans. They're the ones that built the major things in Petra that we visit and all that. The Nabataeans uh, caused the emergence of a place called Idiomea. That's the Greek way of saying Edomites. The nomadic Nabataeans migrated out of Arabia into Edom and drove the Edomites westward. And directly west of Edom were established routes of passage. The land was historically more prosperous and resourceful than the land of Edom, which had unfertile deserts and jagged mountains and what have you. The land also bore a family asso association, because let's not forget that Esau and Jacob were brothers of the same father and mother. They were twins in the, t in the womb. They should have been getting along, but they became enemies from the beginning, and it endured through their lifetimes and beyond. Land was being vacated west of the Dead Sea when the Jews were being exported into captivity by the Babylonians. So the Edomites moved in this prime real estate and just took over. Okay? So get the picture here. Edom is being driven by the Nabataeans north and westward, and they end up creating their own country called Idiomea. That's the Greek way of speaking of the Edomites. They take over Hebron, as their capital. If you look on the early Roman maps of the first century, you will find Idumea on the Roman maps. And you need to try to understand the confusion in the Roman mind. They looked at Edomites as a kind of Jew. They both came from the same. They looked at the squabble between the Edomites, between Esau and Jacob, as a family squabble. They didn't get into that. They regarded an Edomite as a kind of Jew. When they appointed a Herod, in power, they assumed he was a kind of Jew. And if they can't, can't, can't get along, that's their problem. They had no real grasp of the deep hatred between them. And uh, so that's the Olam Iba. So we have the emergence of Idumea. So when the Babylonian captivity, uh, the Edomites seized on the Amalekite territory, so Idumea became to mean the region between the Arabah and the Mediterranean. Hebron, which is about 19 miles south of Jerusalem, began to be their new frontier. And it's a great place. But here's a piece of history that you wouldn't have unless you've done some homework that's essential for understanding, is that the Edomites, when the Jews were finally in power, they forced them to convert. You may, the, the Hebron remained under Edomite control until Judas Maccabeus retook the city under Jewish control in 164 B.C. You remember Antiochus Epiphanes did his desecration of the temple, which sparked the Maccabean revolt. Judas Maccabeus and his five sons successfully threw off the yoke of the Greek Empire, and they, their family name was Hasmonean. The Hasmoneans ruled then from roughly 164 B.C. right up until the time the Romans took over by, under Pompey and all of that. So it was a window of time where the Jews were in control, and during that time they did some interesting things. 
38 years later, 126 B.C., they had to be reconquered by the Jewish army under prince and high priest John Hyrcanus. And John, the Idumeans there were forced to either die, flee, or be proselyted into Judaism. This is sort of an inversion. You know, we're familiar in Spain where Jews were forced to become Christians under penalty of death. Well, the inverse happened here back in the second century in that region under the Hasmoneans. Uh, second century BC, I'm talking about. That uh, the Idumeans were forced to convert to Judaism. So that's going to cause a lot of confusion, especially to the Roman minds, in terms of, okay, they're li they were a kind of Jew anyway. There they are. They're being converted back into their family and their mind. And this is in First Maccabees and also in jo Joseph's writings on the Antiquities of the Jews. So that r that's the rise of the Idumeans. When in 47 BC, when Julius Caesar promoted Idumean Antipater as procurator of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, he thought he was appointing an, a, a type of Jew, an Idumean. In 37 BC, the Romans named Herod, the son of Antipater, as king over Israel. They saw him in Jewish eyes, as if he was Jewish. His mother was Nabataean. And uh, the Idumeans had five centuries of prior history in Israel by the time of the arrival of the Messiah Jesus. Get that background. Of course, when you get to 70 AD, Jerusalem, of course, falls to the Romans. And uh, there's civil turmoil among the zealots, the Idumeans, and the Orthodox Jews. Over 20,000 Idumean infantry slaughtered many of the Orthodox Jews. They were enemies of the Jews. The Idumeans, the Edomites, and the, and the, and the sons of uh, Jacob hate each other. And many were killed, sold into slavery, or enjoined among the 40,000 set free by Caesar. And so uh, this leads to the renaming of the land. Um, when, when Bar Kokhba has his 200,000 men at his command, and he, he th had a rebellion and captured Jerusalem and many strongholds throughout the country. And it took the, uh, the, the uh, Roman legions some time. Uh, Emperor Hadrian had, had called upon legion upon legion to crush the Jewish insurgents. And Hadrian came to the conclusion that he could never rule this unruly land as long as there was any Jewish presence in Jerusalem. So when he finally defeats the Bar Kokhba revolt, he also levels the city and builds a Roman city there and, and uh, outlaws any Jewish presence in that region. But he also wants to rename the place after what is, in his mind, the biggest enemy. Over 580,000 lost their lives there, in that, by the way. And he tried to you know, stamp out Jewish nationalism entirely. Traditions of circumcision, the Sabbath, the reading of the Torah was forbidden under penalty of death. And so, okay, in their choice of the Jews' worst enemy, the Romans had two choices, Idumea or Philistia. These are both traditional enemies. But Idumea, as much as the Jews and the Edomites hate each other, to the Roman mind, that's a family squabble. They saw an Idumean like Herod as a, type, a kind of Jew. So they rather pick the name of Philistia. They knew that the Philistines were the traditional enemy of Israel, so they want to name the whole place Philistia, in effect. In the Latin, it's Palestina. That's where the word Palestine comes from. That term is a term of Israel's enemies. And so that's a... Uh... Now, the maps until about 135 AD, after the Bar Kokhba revolt, still displayed Idumea. And after the Romans chose to, chose to name the land Palestina, Idumea disappeared from future maps in history because the Romans are out to erase that history if they possibly can. The Edomites, later known as Idumeans, became assimilated into the Palestinians today. I'm not suggesting that all Palestinians are Edomites, but if you're looking for Edomites, you'll find them among what is labeled today as Palestinians. There really is no standard people, never have been, known as Palestinians. That's a, a, a convenient term of the press in modern days. It's a, it's a deliberate obfuscation by those that have an agenda. And uh, Now, I won't get into it all here, but I want to highlight for you that there are still today many who appear today as Jews but really are not. And none other than Jesus Christ makes two references to them in his letters to the seven churches. In Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9, Jesus talks about those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And I think it's very worthwhile 
for you to do what you can to find out what that may mean. Different experts will have different opinions. And I don't have the time in this brief thing, pardon me, I don't have time in this brief thing to um, go into it in adequate depth. I just want to alert you to do your own homework and come to your own conclusions. And so, when you get to Ezekiel 25 through 32, you'll discover that there are seven peoples that Jesus chooses to, to judge when he returns in power. And they're listed there in Ezekiel 25 through 32. We have Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt, singled out uh, for judgment. The nations, what, you ha- what they have in common, of course, what do these have in common? They're all, they are all Muslims. These are all Muslims. Now, of all of these, the one that's the most severe throughout the entire Bible is the judgment against Edom. The judgment against Edom is mentioned in more Old Testament books than it is against any other foreign nation. And you can go through Isaiah 11 and 35, 34 and 63, Jeremiah 9 7 and, and 25 and 49 and so forth. Ezekiel 25, of course, and 35. Joel 3, Amos 1 and 9 and so forth. The entire book of Obadiah focuses on this, and we go into this in much more detail in our commentary uh, on Obadiah and so on. So I wanted you to be aware of that. Okay, so we're at the first verse of chapter 12. Now about that time Herod, the king, stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And as I went through all that, Herod Agrippa was the, the nephew of Herod Antipas, who murdered John the Baptist. He's the grandson of Herod the Great, the son of Aristobulus and Bernice of the Maccabean or Hasmonean line. And he was the murderer of the innocents at the birth of our Lord. And Paul will make his celebrated defense in chapter 26 before his son, Herod Agrippa II. But that, and the Herods were Edomites, and that's why I wanted to get a little bit of perspective of that. Herod Agrippa I was brought up in Rome with Caligula and Claudius. And uh, the, uh, on the succession of Caligula to the empire, he obtained from him the dominions of his uncles, Philip and Herod Antipas, Batanasia, Tachinitis, and uh, Ernitus. After the death of Philip, Galilee and Perea on the banishment of Antipas to Gaul and Abilene with the title of the king. So if you really want to do some background, I'll let you wade through the background of this family and its politics in the gospel period. Now, Herod and Agrippa I, on the accession of Claudius, he was further invested with the sovereignty of Samaria and Judea, thus having at length all the dominions over which his grandfather, Herod the Great, had reigned, and from which he derived an immense revenue. So he was very, very powerful, very wealthy. He was of Roman habits, lived for 30 years in Rome, boon companion to every kind of vice of the son of the emperor. And the debauchery and the vice in Rome is legendary. We don't have to get into that here. But uh, he also had Jewish interests, though. He interceded when Caligula ordered an image of himself in the temple. He tried to get that uh, obfuscated. He, he, was the, he was the last king, the sycophant of the child of the Roman voluptuousness. Uh, and uh, the, uh, An Edomite attempting to retain his Jewish power, supremely given over to all manner of Greek frivolity. And this man is the representative of the people whom God had offered to rule. This was the man who stretched forth his hand to vex the church of God. And one of the first things he does is kill James. So he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. That's his big contribution. James, the brother of John, surnamed Barnes, is that his son of thunder, was at the transfiguration. He was at the raising of Jairus' daughter in the garden. James, Peter, Peter, James, and John were recognized as the inside three on all these major events that occurred. And uh, Herod Agrippa killed James with a sword, even though he had roamed behind him. He was an Edomite and was anxious to win favor with the leadership of the Jews. He thought this would improve his popularity with the Jews. Because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions, however you pronounce that, of soldiers to keep him, intending after, uh, and the King James says Easter, the word is mistranslated, the word is Passover, to bring him forth to the people. And uh, these quaternions of soldiers, 
They're simply squads of four men each, by the way. That's just the, the term. And this is the third time for Peter to be in that predicament. But I don't want to pass over something else here while we're here. This term Easter shows up in your King James Bible. It's a mistake. Easter is a pagan holiday. It has to do with the, the worship of Astarte, roughly the same time on their calendar. But it's a mistranslation of what the Greek actually says. The a- Greek actually is talking about Peshach. It's talking about Passover. Now, there is an aspect of this I want you to be aware of, just as, you stu- as a student of the Bible. You need to understand the very fact that in the King James translation, we have echoes of this anti-Semitism that occurs in the early church. It's Passover. It's not Easter. Those are two different things. They happen to be co-located closely on the calendar. No, it's Passover. But that was a controversy in the early church, by the way, I want you to be aware of. I want to show you an example of how prejudice and early anti-Semitism injured both Israel and the church. Both got hurt by this. We get into a thing called quartodecimanism. That's a Latin phrase meaning quartodecima. Fourteenism is what it really means. It refers to the practice of fixing the celebration of Passover for Christians on the 14th day of Nisan on the Old Testament calendar. That's what Leviticus 23 requires. And the, there were those in the early church that had a Jewish background that understood that Passover had to do with, the, with Golgotha and with the, the crucifixion of Christ. And they attempted to worship on the Jewish calendar, which was nailed to the 14th of Nisan. That's why these were called 14-isms. Okay? But the church, in their zeal to separate themselves from Jewishness, the quartodecimans were excommunicated by the Roman church. This, see, this was the original way of fixing the date of Passover, which is, according to Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, it was supposed to be a perpetual uh, ordinance forever. Why? Because it celebrates the Golgotha, the Christ offering himself as the Lamb of God. John the Baptist introduces him publicly with that Jewish title, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so, but by the time you get to the second century, these tensions get worse and worse. In 115 to 125 AD, the Roman church celebrated Passover on a Sunday, at least since the time of Bishop Zistus or Sextus. They, they picked a Sunday. And uh, in 154, Polycarp visited Rome to discuss the difference in Pascal calculation with bish- another bishop uh, reaching an amicable re- compromise. And Polycrates of Ephesus and Irenaeus wrote in support of the Quartodecimans. There were some of the church fathers that recognized the Quartodecimans were the correct ones. But the church was trying hard to, uh, to get them out of the picture. You get to the pivotal Council of Nicaea. The council unanimously ruled that Easter festival should be celebrated throughout the Christian world on the first Sunday after the full moon following the vernal equinox, and that if the full moon should occur on a Sunday and thereby coincide with the Passover festival, Easter should be commemorated on the following Sunday. In other words, they adapted a formula that was not only incorrect, if it by accident it was correct, they postponed it a week. The church is trying to find a formula to celebrate that is not biblical. And as a result of the Council of Nicaea and amended by numerous other subsequent meetings, the formal church deliberately attempted to design a formula for Easter which would avoid any possibility of falling on the Jewish Passover, even accidentally. And on top of that, the quartodecimans were excommunicated. If you were trying to be biblical within the Christian church, you were excommunicated. See this tension, this anti-Semitism of the church, the Christian... You, you and I as Christians, cannot imagine the perspective of the Jew that knows his history towards Christians. The Crusaders had contests to see how many Jewish babies they could get on one sword. The kinds of atrocities that were created throughout history against the Jews under the banner of Christ are unbelievable. Most of us haven't done our homework. We're not aware of half of that. It's important that you have a grasp of that when you visit Israel. You need to understand that this history militates against a comfort on the Jewish people to trust Christians. They know that Hitler was not only a Christian, he was never excommunicated by the Vatican. Christian and Gentile tend to be synonyms in their mind, and those are people that have trod on them throughout history. We need to understand that. And we notice that this is happening early in the church. 
This, of course, was tragic for the Jews to get this abuse from the Christian community. It's also tragic for the church because we've lost our Jewish roots. Today, many Christians are discovering the Jewish roots of the Old Testament and they're rich and full and rewarding. And that's a form of rediscovery that has been deliberately buried by the organized church for many, many centuries. Anyway, let's keep going on here with our exploration of chapter 12. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And uh, so he, he, th- when he's in prison, there's two forces at work. He was kept in prison by Herod on the one hand, but prayer was made earnestly by the church, and my money's on the church. Huh? And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And uh, that's a sinner's condition, by the way. Asleep, indifferent, bound in chains of our sins, guarded by Satan's emissaries, doomed to die. So you can make a metaphor of that if you want and think it through. It's kind of interesting. And of course, the sinner cannot do anything for himself. He's saved by a messenger from heaven. Oh, And behold, an angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly! And his chains fell off his hands. And uh, notice it says, the angel of the Lord, that's actually should, again, it's one of these places it should be an angel. It's not as if there's a special one. This is an angel. It's one of a group. This is not an Old Testament incident of the pre-incarnate Christ, as that term is used elsewhere. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. Peter may have thought he's just having a dream. He he may not realize this is really going on. So the angel says, Get dressed. This is not a dream. (laughs) And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. In other words, this is sort of a dream state as far as Peter thinks. When they were past the first and second ward, they came to the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. He must, about this time beginning to realize, whoa, this is real. This is really happening. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, so it's John Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And John Mark came from a rich family, apparently. He was a young, spoiled guy to some extent. And there's a whole story about him we deal with in the Gospel of Mark because he ends up being Peter's amanuensis. But anyway, uh, there were many people gathered praying in this house. Mary, the mother of God, uh, 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 the writer of the Gospel of Mark. Her brother was Barnabas, uh, who was also a man of substance. So this is a rich family on both sides. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. Rhoda. And when she... When she knew Peter's voice, (laughs) she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Wow, Peter's outside. I'm sure somebody must say, why don't you let him in? (laughs) So she was appropriately cautious, uh, but she could have let him in. And they said to one another, thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. And they said, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. Skeptical Christians are the ones that don't bring umbrellas when you have a prayer meeting for rain, right? And so, and he beckoning unto them with a the, with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go, show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. James, uh, this is a different, this is, this is, a, this is not, <laughs> this is a different one. This is, the, uh, this is the Lord's brother that he's talking about who ends up chairing or uh, being the head of the council in Jerusalem by the time you get to Acts 15. But Peter departs and went to another place and the history of Peter in the book of Acts ends here. This is, la- is the last mention of him. And uh, so, now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, 
he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. This is, I think I mentioned in one of our previous studies, I mentioned that the, prison, the, the keeper of the prison was responsible for the unfilled um, sentences of his, his uh, charge. And whatever, uh, when he lost somebody like this, he was accountable. In this case, Herod didn't mess around, ordered him to be killed. Being a, 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 in charge of a prison was no small responsibility. And uh, that's exactly what uh, Paul dwells on in Colossians chapter 2 when he speaks of our certificate of debt and how it's paid in full, written to Telestai across it. Paid in full. That's what, Je that's what Jesus' word on the cross, to Telestai. It is finished. It is paid in full. And he paid our price. That's our, where we get our justification. He did it all. We can't add to it. He did it all. And since he did it all, we can't lose it if we have it. And so... It's interesting how the, um, yeah, the keepers are responsible for the loss of the prison. So Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. So, so he, uh, Herod was, uh, had a very hostile mind towards these people, but his insider, the chamberlain as they call him, um, uh, and Blastus, Blastus, by the way, was, was a, uh, a common name. Um, it means butter sprout, actually. And so um, Herod cut off the export of food to their country, and they're there to, uh, to try to negotiate something. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god, not of man. <laughs> Big mistake. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the goat. And uh, it's interesting, Herod's grandfather, Herod the Great, died of the same horrible disease. And so Herod's death, Josephus says, uh, Herod was at Caesarea presiding over the games in the honor of Caesar. On the second day of the games, Agrippa entered at daybreak clothed in the robe of silver on which the rays of the morning sun were light, uh, sl uh, lighting. He appeared as if irradiated with glory. Numerous voices saluted him as a god. And on his making an oration to them, he, they shouted, We have taken thee for a man, but henceforth we recognize thee a god. And uh, the king rebuked them not, nor showed any displeasure at this impiety. He saw an owl perched on a rope over his head, and immediately taking this for an ill omen, he was filled with remorse and was seized with violent pain in his bowels, exclaiming to his friends, Your God has already come to his life's end, and he unto he who you saluted immortal is going away to die. And to such a height did the pain rise that he had to be carried hastily into the palace where after five days of torture he expired in his fifty fourth year. That's out of all out of Josephus. Getting back to Acts chapter 12, verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. In other words, we know him as Mark, John Mark. Persecution didn't hurt the church at all. It helped it to grow. Barnabas, Saul, and Mark, the nephew of Barnabas, are on their way to Antioch, 300 miles before them. In those days, that's a long way. Jerusalem is behind them in more ways than one. So Jerusalem is a thing of the past. And so the Acts of Peter. Um, on Pat Pentecost, he preaches many uh, uh, become believers, and he heals a lame man arrested with John and warned not to preach. They follow Philip into Samaria, and many believe. And uh, then Peter goes to Lydia and Joppa to raise Dorcas from death. And Cornelius the centurion has a vision at Caesarea and sends for Peter. Peter has a vision at Joppa and goes to Caesarea. And many become believers. That was the whole thing of chapter 10. He, res he reports to Jerusalem church uh, that the gospel is for Gentiles too. That's a big deal for in chapter 11. Peter's arrested, miraculously released, and then testifies at the Jerusalem council. And uh, so the rest of Peter's work 
We know that Peter meets Paul in Antioch. We find that in Galatians chapter 2. In fact, Paul redresses him for a lapse. He goes back to his Jewish uh, ways that are uh, uh, narrow and inappropriate, and, and Paul calls him down on that. And uh, the, uh, Peter visits churches in North Asia Minor, we find in his first letter. Uh, there's evidence of Peter at Corinth, we find in 1 Corinthians 1. He wrote his first letter from Babylon. Now, there's a lot of nonsense about this. Some people have theory that Babylon was a code name for Rome. That's nonsense. Babylon was a major Jewish center. When, the, uh, the, when, when Babylon took them captivity for 70 years, they were finally released and went home uh, because uh, the, the, uh, Cyrus gives them financial incentives to go back and build your temple. Many of them didn't. Only less than 50,000 took advantage of Cyrus's decree to go back to the land. Many of them stayed there. They're perfectly comfortable, and they actually end up creating a major Jewish presence in Babylon. In fact, when you get to the second, third, fourth centuries, when the, co- the oral law, as they call it, gets codified in what they call the Talmud, there are two fo- Talmuds drafted. One is called the Jerusalem Talmud, which wasn't in Jerusalem, it was in Tiberias, but the point is the second one is called the Babylonian Talmud. And of the two, the Babylonian Talmud is the more authority- authoritative one simply because the academy there in Babylon survived the other one by several centuries. So it's larger and stronger and it's the primary one. So this whole idea that, that uh, it, Peter was in Babylon. He wrote his uh, first letter, first Peter, from Babylon. Not Rome, it was Babylon. The Rome emphasis is a contrivance, if you will, of the Vatican to try to build their particular brand of, uh, you know, uh, package of history. And so that is what it is. But um, So there's strong evidence that Mark, a follower of Peter, wrote his gospel in Rome just after Peter's death using Peter's eyewitness preaching about Jesus. And so Peter was executed in Rome just as the Lord had predicted. And uh, Mark wrote his gospel in Rome just after Peter's death. And uh, so, again, let's just review the marching orders that we've been following through this whole unit. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And chapters 8 through 12 are Judea and Samaria. The first seven, of course, Jerusalem. And then we have chapters 13 to, 20, uh, to 28. Unit 2 is devoted entirely to the uttermost part of the earth, which becomes the domain of Paul, one of the greatest minds that have ever walked the earth. Incredible background, both in Greek and in Hebrew. And uh, one of the richest sources of insight in the entire Holy Scripture was penned by our friend Paul. And so, uh, so with that, unit one is Philip and Peter, but Rick Philip was a deacon, not the apostle. And then uh, that's chapters one through 12 that we've just been through. And so uh, unit two will be uh, Paul and uh, chapters 13 and 28 to the uttermost part of the earth. Those are the two units we've chosen to split the entire book into two more manageable parts uh, for purpose of administration here. There are interesting parallels between these units that might be worth counting here. In chapters 1 and 12, Jerusalem is the center. Peter's the chief figure. He's out to, he, out to Samaria. The word is rejected by the Jews of the homeland. Peter is imprisoned. Judgment on Herod is, you know, wraps up. In the unit 2, we have Antioch the center, not Jerusalem. Paul is the chief figure, not Peter. It goes, it goes out to Rome, not just Samaria. The word is rejected by the Jews of the dispersion, not the Jews of the homeland, but the same rejection takes place. Uh, Peter was imprisoned in Unit 1. Paul will be imprisoned in Unit 2. And the judgment was on Herod in, chapter, in the first unit. It'll be on the Jews themselves in Unit 2. So for what it's worth. There are parallels here in another way. We have the first sermon, the lame man healed, and Simon the sorcerer, and influence shadow, and laying on of hands, and Peter worshipped. These are milestones in the Chronicle of Peter, if I want to lay them out that way. And uh, Peter, of course, is in prison at the end. And uh, Paul's first, cur- first sermon is in chapter 13. There is again a lame man healed. Simon the sorcerer is paralleled by Elimus the sorcerer in chapter 13. There was the influence of the shadow thing in chapter 5. There's going to be a handkerchief thing in chapter 19. Um, there were laying on of hands is a big thing in both in the one and the other. And uh, Peter was worshipped 
in Unit 1, Paul is worshipped in Unit 2, and uh, Tabitha is raised in uh, Unit 1, and uh, Eutychus is raised in uh, Unit 2, and Bo- he also is, ends up in prison. So there is some interesting parallels in the Chronicle of both Peter in Unit 1 and Paul in Unit 2. And so we are at the end of Unit 1. We've come to the end of the first unit of the Book of Acts. And uh, the Gospel has gone to Judea and Samaria. And beginning with the next chapter, we will see the movement of the Gospel to the uttermost part of the earth. And uh, we are still in that movement today. And because that is chronicled for you in order in Revelation 2 and 3. In fact, if those letters were in any other order, it wouldn't be true. But they actually lay out a history of the church all the way to the present day, the day of the Church of Laodicea. And so we invite you to take a look at that. And with that, we will have a closing prayer.